Hi everybody, welcome to episode 10 of series two. So this is the last episode of this series and um, we've decided today to go freestyle. So um, we could of course have come up with a specific topic, we could have asked people for a topic, but we thought we would just see what came out and then um, and go easy this last week and, and just see what occurs to us. And I guess if this um, if this format works, we may well do some of it in the future. So tell us if you like it because, um, or if you hate it, because that, that might also help <laughs> us decide whether to do it again. Um, as always, uh, follow us on any social media, get in touch on the website if there's stuff that comes up for you, uh, join the Facebook group, you know, do connect with with the conversation outside the podcast. We'd love to, um, we'd love to do that with you. And um, yeah, so let's get into today's conversation. So Natalie, should we start with you? Tell us about yeah. what's been happening in your week. Well, firstly, I can't believe we're at the end of another series. It goes so, so fast. The, the Thursdays go by really quickly. Um, I'm really enjoying the chats. And I think we've all said off there that we all, there's some unlearning that goes on for us all as part of these conversations. And um Particularly for me around the, the not enough story, I know we've spoken about that quite a bit um, and I posted on my Facebook page this week because um, it's really useful to sort of get practical with it and see it happening in your own life and notice those moments when those feelings start to arise in you and I had it this week when getting my daughter ready to go back to school lovingly preparing her sandwiches getting her ready and um, doing all the right stuff and then she just turned around because she's in one of those tricks and moves at the moment she just looked at me and she went daddy's going to take me and daddy's going to bring me back and it's not going to be you <laughs> and then she flicked her hair and walked off and it, obviously she wasn't mega serious but something inside me went Ugh! and I thought oh my goodness there's something there and normally I probably would have acted out a little bit on her but I was like ah I know what that is took myself away and just sat with the discomfort and was like ah that's the not enough mum feeling mm -hmm. <laughs> where normally I would search for lots of evidence to add to that story and, and kind of the bias that creates those stories and beliefs but I kind of was able to go oh yeah that's that's just fled up and it was a real example a real life example of what mm -hmm. we talk about so yeah that was really useful yeah very cool and I love it that how you see like the, the the normal acting out that would have happened like inevitable from that moment of tension and not enough or mm. separate insecure yeah, yeah. quick blame that out there even if it's your five-year-old daughter yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's your fault yeah <laughs> you made me yeah. feel like this <laughs> yeah mad hmm. what about you Gary what's been happening for you oh god <clears throat> lots of things I suppose um most of my kind of week has always been uh I'm a kind of prolific um consumer of information shall we say so I always go out and I'm reading stuff and I'm looking at stuff and uh, I'm challenging my beliefs about things um, and ever since the the George Floyd incident there's been a lot of me going and looking at that whole story uh, and looking what's sort of happening in people's um, thinking and how people think about it and looking at each side of it and um, for me that's kind of awoken more um, this desire to to really focus on more on sort of getting people to see through this story of separation, this story of illusion um, that we bring to the party that, um, that yeah, we believe that there, that there's something else other than just um, this one thing that's going on, this, uh, this one um, experience that we're all having and we're all sharing. So uh, yeah, that's for me. And, that, and then I've been doing a lot of um, kind of more meditation as well recently. Uh, which is uh, starting to to have a lot more benefit, um, focusing on different styles and trying different things out. Uh, and then just seeing how you show up as well, seeing that you're showing up um, a little bit differently uh, than you were before. Um, like you say, Nat, just being a bit more aware of what's happening in the body uh, and feeling that a lot more. Um, and because the body's always kind of in the, in the present moment, it, it's always telling you um, what's going on and you just have to listen to it uh, and... Um, and not kind of, like you say, find an idea for, for why it's happening that way. Because we have an emotion, then we go out and go, oh, well, what, what's the evidence that supports this emotion? Um, and mm. that evidence is just not there uh, when we really go look for it. Mm. Yeah, that last bit reminds me of when, in my early coaching with this with Piers, um, he talked about our feelings are like a thermometer. Like the, a thermometer can only tell us about the temperature now. It can't tell us about the temperature even a minute ago 
and it can't tell us about the temperature in a minute's time. It can only tell us about now. And the only thing that temperature is being read from is thinking in the moment. There's nothing else it can do. And then, yeah, like you had Nat, it's then seeing that that thinking is, is just that story. It's just that narrative that doesn't actually say anything about you. Just really seemed like it all this time, didn't it? And I listened to a podcast yesterday, I think it's Claire Diamond, that did a podcast, about a short one about anger. It's really, really helpful and really pertinent. I don't know if this happens to you, but tend to listen to stuff that's sometimes showing up in your life. It's that synchronous thing going on again. Um, and there'd been about a, well, a flash of anger yesterday about children's behaviour and then a critique on parenting styles that looked like it was really personal for both of us. Um, and um, it was really good to listen to something that reminded me about anger is okay. You know, you've got to, anything that shows up has already shown up. So to try and push it back is really not helpful at all. To recognise that whatever is showing up is invited to show up, it's free to come and that's fine. So that's great. But then also just really think how that, that can never be personal and yet it looks so, so very personal because people are only ever acting out based on the quality of thinking in that moment and, and that's held by belief. And we all, you know, the barometer goes up and down all the time. I know we've mentioned that we this clarity and then suddenly back in the eye again, back in the big beliefs and it all looks really true. But just that gap of that perspective of knowing that that's what's happening gives you enough freedom to go, ah, don't need to get so consumed by it this time. Mm -hmm. mm. So um, uh, there's a Sanguru, Sanguru the Indian mystic um, on uh, YouTube, he's quite big. Um, <laughs> he's quite big. Like, I have millions of followers. <laughs> <on this. laughs> like a global spiritual a global, teacher. <laughs> global spiritual teacher. But he talks about the inevitability of this moment, that, mm -hmm. that each moment has this inevitability in it. Um, and it's seeing that inevitability that that frees you because it's just it's just very difficult to talk about isn't it with it it's just this moment has an inevitability and this moment has an inevitability and this moment has an inevitability the next moment is completely free and open of all possibilities mm -hmm. but this moment just has an inevitability to it and seeing that is just it allows you just to accept what's ever what's ever's here in that moment without needing to do anything about it um, and then that gives you freedom because then you can uh, respond instead of kind of just reacting that's really reminded me of um i've gone back to listening to deepak chopra's daily breath recently i've not mm. listened for ages so i'm still i'm back in may at the minute mm. with that um <coughs> but he this morning was talking about like the three levels of reality so we've got this physical level of reality that we think is entirely real and the only thing for many years. And then we maybe start to recognise um, the energetic level of reality beneath that, which is a pure information and data exchange. And then beneath that is like the, the ultimate, the absolute, the oneness, consciousness, whatever you want to use to describe it, the universe, the nothingness. Um, but saying how... Yeah, so the experience we have on the surface here is like the artifacts of that, of what else else is real below it. So I love that, what you've just said, Gary, because it's so, it's, it is like that. And, and it connects to yours as well, that like the, it's just, it's already happened. Like it's already arisen. It's, it, it's, even if it was a few seconds ago, it started in that nothingness. By the time we come to experience it in the physical world, it's so far past the moment that it was first originated. It's like it's done and dusted, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's nothing that can change it. Does that sound like the same kind of thing, Gary? Yeah, definitely. Saying? It's, yeah, it's the, the time we become aware of it. Um, conscious awareness is such a small part of the brain. And we think it's the only thing that there is because it's the only thing we can notice. We can't notice anything other than consciousness. Um, and... It's such a small part of the brain. It's there's so much more depth in the brain, and and so much more of consciousness that we can't see. Sometimes we're not even looking in the right direction. Um, but you know, the more you keep going down into consciousness, the more it kind of unveils itself. But the time we get to to be aware of something, then it's already happened. It's it's already here, and um, there's not a lot you can do about it. You know? 
So <laughs> not accept, you can not accept it if you want to. It's not going to change anything. So then that makes me think, what is the thing that till now has seemed like it's either not accepted it or it's pushed it away or it's like Nat, you start you talked about you know sitting with the discomfort of it or you know I've certainly I've had experiences recently and in the past of trying to deny something trying to pretend something's not really happening so what's going on there because it does it really seems like there's a something which is able to like squash an emotion down or ignore it or resist an experience that's happening it's like, so what's that? Well, it can only really be the egoic eye, can't it? It can only be this sense of the imagined self navigating and believing things need to be a certain way and then trying to limit, I don't know, not, not realising how much it's limiting the experience of life. And, and the one thing I really think, which I know you experience it yourself, is the, the capacity to go in when you feel discomfort. And I think I naturally could do that in certain scenarios, but others I would just always go out and, and look to the world for it. And now I really, really see that the world is a mirror of the internal. It can't ever not be, ever. So it's the first place to look, obviously, now. Yeah. Yeah, it's just... For me here, it's more like a, it's a misidentification with the, with the I thought. I mean, there has to be an ego. Ego exists because it exists. Um, so, you know, I need a different ego for doing this. I need a different ego for driving. I need a different ego for um, interfacing with people and in relationships. You know, something shows up in each moment to, to cope with the situation. But then there's a misidentification with whatever shows up sometimes. And that is formed out of a thought. It's the I thought, like you're saying that. It's the, it's the, it's the attachment to something that comes after I, um, and not even seeing that the thing we are is a thing that's before I. That that once you even have this start to formulate the I thought, it, you've already attached yourself to it, um, mm. and you have to attach yourself to it. You can't not operate life without attaching yourself to I thoughts. It doesn't work. You can't, otherwise you're just going to sit and walk around in, or not even move um, so, you, so there's that constant reminding yourself or just you know having that awareness to, to know who you are and that you're not any kind of thought pattern um, you don't exist in, in that thought pattern because um, you can't be found in it because if you go look you just can't find yourself um, it's the, you know, you're not there so uh yeah yeah it's just that misidentification for me mm. yeah it, um, yeah um, it's reminding me of the jill bolte taylor um there's a ted talk i think she's thinking the ted talk certainly on youtube anyway um show notes put in the show notes um where <laughs> she so she was a neuroscientist who had a stroke and it totally took her left brain offline and she had this experience of right brainness which was mm -hmm. what I guess people describe in an enlightenment experience you know there's there was no edges to forms you know she couldn't tell where she ended and something else started she couldn't read she couldn't speak um I think there was something like she was trying to to phone somebody's number and she just there was no ability to to process the, the number onto a into a phone I can't remember how she managed to eventually do it and somehow the this colleague like sent help we could obviously tell something was wrong <laughs> um but yeah so she had that experience and, and it took her a long time to rehabilitate obviously from an experience like that but then so what she sees now is that like that left brain which is where the eye thought orig appears from but it's also where the um well, it's the conceptual mind. It's the ability to differentiate between objects and people and to use words and to navigate the world. Um, and so she she now feels like she really has that balance of the two where she knows how useful all these concepts are because, yeah, like you say, Gary, otherwise you'd just be yeah. blob doing nothing, which I guess is what the what that 
often comes to mind when people start this conversation, isn't it? It's like, oh my God, but I'll be just this lump in the corner and I'll be completely demotivated and mm-hmm. I, what will I do? And and it's the, so that's the, the story of the I, isn't it? Thinking my life will be over if, I, if I'm not here to keep the motivation going. Mm-hmm. But really there's like, that's like one activity, it's just that, that's the activity of thought. The left brain in itself is just really useful to go, oh, Gary, Natalie, computer, yeah, yeah. conversation. <laughs> Where the right brain is doing the whole picture and it's the, it's the source of creativity and it's, or it's the mechanism at least which sort of brings that creativity into the world, the, mm-hmm. the kind of conduit of it. And I listen to Muji a lot. Um, I know we all have our preferred people that would be maybe drawn to listen to. Just I, I love his wit, which is kind of imbued in this whole beautiful spirituality. But um, And he kind of reminds us that the mind is not a menace. We think that it's something to transcend, to overcome. And, and yet really it can be very useful. And it's that when we set ourselves up in opposition to the mind, clearly it's going to become a battle. It's going to become something that looks like it needs to be overcome. And that's the yeah, coming back in, in you know trying to do this do and succeed in whatever it's doing but um yeah I think it was really helpful to see that it's a servant to the heart and then it will come back into its natural alignment rather than just fighting something all the time mm-hmm. mm. and yeah and then also sorry Gary I was about to say something just in that uh can't remember who it was this week somebody was saying about um about the sort of is it is it necessary like god i've just discovered this i wish i'd known this earlier Mm. but it does seem like it is necessary for us to go through these earlier stages doesn't it of of identification and attachment and the chasing and Mm. we've talked before about the addictive nature of of that attachment and more of this you know Mm. find the right person get the right job take the right drugs whatever (laughs) the thing is that looks like it's needed Mm -hmm. to fulfill this voice of lack and then eventually we get to the place of going, oh, nothing's working. Well, what else then? What else could there be? Um, yeah. And it's, it really seems like that's necessary, doesn't it, to kind of go through that egoic attachment phase to then come to where you've just said that about what Muji's saying of just accepting and allowing and seeing its its place in the whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does seem that the people who go on this journey have to go through that kind of stage first. Um, yeah, maybe that's just, it's, it's a part of growing up, isn't it? It's a part of, mm-hmm. of um, yeah, it's, you know, I think there's something inside of us that, that wants to experience the infinite, um, that's looking for that experience um, and seeking it. Um, and that's how it manifests in life in lots of behaviors that we do, you know, whether it be money, whether it be relationships, whether it be, you know, acquiring whatever. Um, that's the, there's this part of us that wants to seek this boundless nature or this infinite nature of ourselves. Um, and it will go looking for it, for it in lots of different activities. Um, yeah. And I suppose, yeah, one of it is that you eventually run out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try something out because I've done, like I think I've said lots of times, counselling, lots of counselling, uh, lots of drug use, uh, and, you know, and had those kind of um, oneness experiences of just being energy and things like that, um, uh, which is pretty amazing. But it's it's also leaves you feeling a little hollow because you can't get back to that. It's just an experience, and it's never the experience. That's that's it. It's just the experience. It's just one, just an aspect of it. Mm. Um, so yeah you can't chase that experience either um, so mm. and so the experience why, sorry oh. you go. I was just going to say is that why um, you know people talk about the come down from whether it's drugs or actually from a really just a general peak experience of life mm-hmm. it's like that it, it, I'm thinking it's kind of like that you've caught a glimmer of what you've been looking for and then you come back down to earth with a bump and you go oh bugger <laughs> it's still like this yeah whereas I guess what this conversation <laughs> does is you you kind of realize where it is permanently you recognize it's not a temporary drug, drug induced or experience induced situation mm. you come to recognize that as the permanent mm. and and then it doesn't need to be sought it's it's here already mm. no exactly 
Uh, and still, if you want to go use psychedelics after that, um, fine, <laughs> be, be my guest. <laughs> no problem w w with it, but cool. it's no longer you're looking for it in that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I was just going to say that it looks so compelling to spend a lifetime looking for it out there, because don't we? All, that's what the consumer world is telling us. That's what all the messaging is telling us. Buy this, do that, invest in that, mm. go for that, chase that job, because that will give you that feeling. We're all looking for that feeling, aren't we? But it's mm. the craziest cosmic joke is it's already there. Yeah. Yeah, can I go back to that thing again? It says Claire Diamond who says it, the um, mountain, no mountain, mountain. So we go from the world of things, the world of objects, completely absorbed and attached to it all. Then we come into this conversation and we unlearn and we recognise what's real and what's unreal. And then we come back into the world of objects and people and meditation and drugs and whatever yeah. but we're doing it from a whole different standpoint it's now a playground instead of a yeah. um a fixing mechanism or a yeah i think i'm just coming back into that period back onto the back into the mountain back into the mountain yeah I, that's what it feels like is it it feels like i'm coming into that <clears throat> that space of oh okay it's 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 fine you know it's that maturity of the of let's call it waking up um but yeah it's the maturity of it that you get to the space where it's, it's all coming back into oh the mountain is it is it just a mountain it's just a tree it's just a you know mm. there's that but that that no mountain phase it's it can be quite unsettling and disruptive for you as well i mean i don't think you we can it sometimes sounds like we you're living in this space of zen and stuff we, um, but it's not it's not like that. The experience isn't like that. You're constantly up and down. You're constantly kind of on shaky foundations and um, things are, are being unveiled and unlearned and ideas that you've had about yourself and other people kind of go, um, things change in your life as that happens. So I don't think it's not a, I'm going to say, yeah, it's just sometimes it can be an uncomfortable process. You know? mm. Not that it's bad or anything. It's just, mm. it can be uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, again, that's ego this time. <laughs> <laughs> the mind always wants to make everything linear. I know we've said that before because it mm. loves it loves order and form and getting somewhere. And it's like I know time is a whole different topic on its own. But um, there is only ever this moment. There's there's nothing more than that. And and that's so simple that the mind is struggles with it so much, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, always looking for the more complex and analysis and yeah. Um, Dave Kibbe actually shared a really useful metaphor with me about uh, I try and get the character right. I can't believe the character was somebody in a Shakespeare play. Is King Lear Shakespeare? Yeah, yeah. King Lear, okay, yeah. let's go with that. <laughs> so King Lear can never know Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So King Lear is that identity and that left brain and that, mm -hmm. that egoic mind, the, the linear. It will try and like understand every aspect of King Lear and like his personality and his family and his background and his, you know, what's his future going to be like and to tr in desperate search of Shakespeare and will never be found and, and will never, never be known by that one. Mm. And it's, it's, it's that, isn't it, that the, yeah, that linear mind's just been searching and searching in the wrong place for what it, but what will only come available when it stops, actually, when, when King Lear stops King Learing, then, <laughs> then Shakespeare appears because he's not being um, covered over by that activity of, of King Lear digging, digging, digging further and further into the, um, into the identity of itself. I love that they rhyme. That makes it even more confusing. King Lear and Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, it was the yeah. Same thing. Maybe it was. Yeah. Because I think Moody had used another kind of metaphor saying the characters in the book can't ever collude against the author and like mm. find the answers to the author. It's the author that has the ability to, to create the story. And we always think of the characters that we're the ones that write the story. And it's like, oh, yeah. I know there's lots of metaphors around films and mm, you know, screens. screens and things, but hopefully it's a little bit more. Yeah. 
Why do you think people don't um, allow themselves to have this kind of conversation? It seems that people won't want to. Yeah, there's this fear about. Um, I think religion has a lot of things in spirituality. That, you know, religion and uh, the ideas of in society about. Um, I'm going to have to use a G word, but the ideas about God and things like that. Um, it's such a loaded term. There's so much there that, that people are scared. Sometimes I think feel scared of going into this conversation because they feel that it's somehow, um, well, it does in the end, but it somehow challenges their, their sense of their self um, and their ideas about themselves. Mm. I think Is that's it? it. I think yeah. that's it. The, the identity can tell this is the end of it. Mm -hmm. The identity knows this, this puts its life as if it was a thing in danger and it will resist anything, won't it, that it thinks is going to challenge, first of all, its stories, <clears throat> hence the like rebuttal and pushing away of anything that, that doesn't align with, no, 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 I believe in pink ice cream, what are you doing with your blue ice cream, that's ridiculous, you know, so it'll, it'll push away everything that doesn't doesn't fit with its stories, but then equally it will push away anything that seems to um yeah threaten it mm. and and this threatens it at a very fundamental level and it doesn't know about shakespeare so it can't know until it, until you start to get glimpses until it starts to be pointed out then it doesn't know there's anything else happening mm -hmm. so why would it like it really does think it's running the show it really does think that it is your your source of everything. It thinks it's your motivation. It thinks it's your creativity. It thinks it's your decision-making abilities. It thinks it's everything. Mm. And bless it, it's never been any of that. <laughs> but until it knows that, it will keep, it will keep running because and, and keep resisting. So yeah, I think there is a kind of there's almost like a, a I think a step of courage needed mm. in the early days, mm -hmm. and a, and a sort of um, in fact, I did some artwork prior to all this uh, leap of, what did I write, leap of faith. This was like bef not long before I came into the conversation and was in a, a yoga and art retreat and put this, this piece of art together and had the words leap of faith across it and, and experience. And then within a couple of months, I was starting this conversation and later on I was like, oh my God, that was, <laughs> that's exactly what has turned out to be true. Um, and it, so it does, it feels a little bit like that. There's got to be a little bit of courage, a little bit of a leap of faith that um, that there is something in this. And like you said before, Nat, about your heart, there is there's something drawing you. And you said, Gary, about like, we're, this is what we've all been searching for. It's that inner, inner knowing, isn't it? That says, no, 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 just keep going. Even though this feels a bit scary, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of like, once you're over the threshold. And of course you have to work with somebody who's who you trust, who who you feel safe with and that's going to be different for everybody but i really really advocate that like find somebody that that works for you that matches for you mm. and and when they stop working move on and work with somebody else like anybody who's really done this work will fully understand that we need different teachers and guides at different stages of our experience mm. and if anybody tries to say no 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 don't don't leave you'll not be okay if if you stop working with me, you know, it's really, that, that's a sure sign to leave actually. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's ego, isn't it? Yeah. It's interesting because what you said before about the not knowing about or not being aware of what we're calling Shakespeare is or the consciousness, you know, what, <laughs> what, I, don't know I don't know whether we're going to just keep going with that metaphor or not. Um, is that there have, and there are glimmers in our lives all the way through that we may not just be aware of, like we talk about flow, don't we? And I certainly remember when I was about 17, 18, or at coming into like that time in my life, being really creative and being really deeply thinking. Um, and it felt like it was allowed. It was all right to feel like that. Um, and writing loads of poetry. I wrote a poem about perception and what perception is. Random. <laughs> and, and now I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, it makes sense to me now. But it didn't make sense to me that I was doing that at the time I was just expressing myself and in a weird way society said that was okay to do that and yet I felt that when I moved into a professional role in my 20s I got rid of all that 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 younger me that was like exploring writing creating 
you know, and because I kind of thought it wasn't very grown up. And then I realized it's completely the opposite way around because that I feel like I've rediscovered that part of me now. And it's, it's like coming home. It really is. Mm. Did you, I know I tagged you on Instagram last night, Natalie, to Kieran. Um, so uh, 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 illustrating rain, she is on Instagram and Twitter. Mm. Um, she's just put out a new podcast and one of the episodes um, in those first three, I can't remember which one it was, but she talked about that, like how society deems anything that's counted as as a creative endeavour, like poetry or art or acting, dance, you know, it's seen as like, oh, that's a nice hobby, pat on the head, bless you. That's very sweet, but that's not a real job. You know, that's not yeah. going to actually earn you money. Mm. And it's it's desperately sad, isn't it? Because so many people have your experience, Natalie, of mm. then squashing that and denying it and going into normal world, real jobs. And then often you eventually come back to it mm. and maybe it was necessary who knows yeah. it's not yeah, yeah. it's it is it's been as it as it's been but mm. um yeah it's um it's knowing that, that that really that's it's always there it's always trying to guide us back isn't it and it's hopefully we come across this conversation rather than perhaps becoming a drug addict it's a little bit healthier uh, way yeah. to find it <laughs> <laughs> um, as it's half past 50 minutes oh. to go just thought I'd give a shout out to anybody watching because we did say if you want to chip in mm. any observations or questions or things that have come up that you want to um, to share and obviously it can be anything give them a, a freestyle this week so yeah just anything that's come up from what we've said already or anything prior to today that you thought mm. you'd want us to to explore or talk about wasn't there some questions about fear as well yeah i was going to mention that yeah Mm. it's a big topic isn't it and and yeah it's uh, it's kind of it's very pertinent because fear crops up quite a lot in this what it has done for me in in this exploration because Mm. it's uh, it that's the the egoic self saying no 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 don't go there because it feels threatened and like, like I've got more comfortable with sitting with that fear and going, it's okay, you know, it's going to be a bit uncomfortable, but I'm, I'm more interested in seeing what's on the other side of the fear now, whereas before I was like, whoa, fear, no, 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 not doing that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when you see that fear is, is coming from you, it's not coming from the thing you can see, um, then it becomes easier to sit with it, but it, it doesn't go away. I mean, fear doesn't, mm. fear is a part of being a human being and... Um, you know, it has to exist, otherwise we wouldn't run away from the lion. Uh, so, you know, it's a useful, um, it's a useful uh, emotion when it's being challenged, uh, channeled in the right way. Um, so, uh, I always but, like Michael Neal's metaphor where he talked about the burglar alarm <clears throat> and like how we how we work with fear or worry versus fear. Like, we we have a burglar alarm installed. And then we spend the, the night pacing the halls. It's essentially like we've got the perfect fear trigger mm-hmm. system, but then the mind paces and paces and paces, not realizing we've got the perfect burglar alarm installed already. Yeah, he did an, another, I can't remember which course it was on, but I remember picking up on it because it was particularly pertinent for me around worry, like lower level worry. Um, and I think sort of explaining very clearly and giving very strong evidence to say that worry is not going to help you in any way. It has no impact on the outcome of a, of, you know, of a situation. It's just a mental rehearsal because your brain believes that somehow by going through every eventuality, you'll reach it, you'll cover off every single option. So you'll be prepared. So everyone was like, yeah, I get it now. And then he's like, raise your hands if you can happily let go of worry now. <laughs> but nobody, or not many people could, which proves that there's still a bit of belief going, yeah, but it's going to serve me some way. <laughs> 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 it's quite, you know, it's quite, a, it's a habitual thing, isn't it, that comes up? Mm. Um, there was that book, I think I, I talked about it. I wrote the title in the comment on Facebook about love is letting go of fear. Um, we'll put that in the show notes as well, but it's a, it's a kind of a, a really nice book um, that's a few years old now, but it really just talks about that, that, you know, to get back to love, I have to let go of that fear. I have to go, okay, I let go of the fear of this, I let go of the fear of that, I let go of the fear of that, because it, I have to move through that to get back to, to love on the other side. Um, so letting go of fear is a, um, 
I was going to say <laughs> a key way, but, it, but it's the only way of getting back to love um, is to let go of that fear that you have about something in the future or some situation or some worry you have. Because when you really check, you just don't know. You don't, you don't know anything really. So going to che once you check and look, um, everything is possible, uh, uh, including a worst case scenario. Um, but because everything is possible, <laughs> then the worst case scenario is one of these um, infinite outcomes, uh, one, one part of infinite outcomes. So it doesn't really make sense anymore to worry about the worst case scenario. Uh. Mm. So that letting go thing, I guess I struggle with that sometimes. I struggle yeah. with it literally because I can't think of an example right now, but I'm pretty sure there'll have been a time where I've been scared of something and I've perhaps been saying, oh, don't be daft, don't be scared, you know, let go of that. That's not a big deal, but it doesn't necessarily change mm -hmm. anything because that I who's trying to do it can't, mm -hmm. it hasn't got, it's a thought, it, it can't change another thought. But, yeah, you're not letting go of it then, you're, you're remaining in conversation with it and you're keeping it. Yeah, so what's the distinction for you then, Gary? Well, letting go of something is to um, yeah you let go of the identification with it because yeah, we're I'm trying to use words and they don't really work um, <laughs> for me it's more of a a bodily energy sensation so it's a um, releasing of the energy of it without um, trying to use a thought to identify or capture it. So um, using a thought to capture fear, fear, you're engaging with fear with the I thought because you believe you're the I thought. So if I talk to my fear, I'm going to, and I engage with my fear, I'll somehow find out about it and work it out and get rid of it. But it's the engagement with it and energetic engagement with it that you that maintains it so to release it is the release of the eye thought around it and really and allow the energy of fear to be there um, and then the energy of fear will just release itself and the energy will just release itself if you don't hold on to it um, so you just release the energy of it uh, and it will drop um, away um, and there's always that undercurrent of bubbling angst anyway just as the the trauma of being alive so <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not going to get, that's that always going to be there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, we're human beings and we're alive. And, you know, there's a certain amount of angst about that, um, which is like background radiation. You know, it's always there and it's not affecting you. You don't have to worry about it. In fact, that's your indication that you're alive. Mm. So, you know, you can keep just feeling that. It's like, oh, I'm alive then. Um, but yeah, letting go of it is, is, an, is a energetic process that's what it feels like um how it's done over there is how it's done for you um mm. but definitely engaging with it in some way is not going to to allow it to let go because it's like having an argument with your children isn't it you know you're engaged in the argument and the argument keeps going um if you let go of the argument on your end you let go of the the, the rope then mm. there's, there's nothing for them to pull against and You've let go of the argument. Um, I get it's difficult to do. But mm. It's not like it doesn't happen. Mm. Yeah. We all engage a bit in, in our emotions. Yeah, and I think I think I, for me it's more the seeing of it, and it can't always be in the moment. Sometimes it's retrospectively, but it's that it's the awareness that transforms things for me. And I think more recently I'm really seeing that everything is love. It can't not be love. So even fear is just a longing to come back to love and then there's less of an oppositional force for it because like you say Gary there's an allowfulness in knowing that that's all it ever is it's just trying to be itself and I'm not letting it be itself so mm -hmm. it may be less energetic for me but more ah oh, there it is it's you know it's doing that thing again rather than oh I'm frightened I'm getting you know immersed in the fear kind of thing yeah and then that's and so that seems really crucial because in that, I hear that shift which happens around, and goes back to what you said at the start, that's about anger. The belief that fear is wrong, the belief that anger is wrong, 
is the exact belief that keeps it all in place. Because then there is a thought that says, well, I've got to get rid of it now. I've got to make it go away. But that very thought keeps the whole thing circling around. Mm. Versus, yeah, it's a natural human experience to get angry sometimes, to feel fearful sometimes. And yeah, your example, Gary, with the kids, that really resonated. So I'll, if it's, gosh, touch wood, it's been a long time, but um, earlier on in lockdown, you know, some major arguments with my son and like almost like I could see the, this huge argument happening, but I couldn't stop it. Like there was no, there was no ability to, to step back, to be the adult. <laughs> it was just like, it was so all consuming, just so in it. And of course, afterwards there was, oh, wow. Yeah. Look at that. That just happened. And, but I think that for me is an example of how with the best will in the world, no thinking, no positive thinking, no intervention was going to change the course of that. And yeah, to your point, Nat, about it's all love. Like there was, there was, that that happened, it needed to happen. That, that anger, that frustration was already there. It needed to kind of go through that process and reach that climax of frustration with each of us with the other for then it to dissipate, for then the energy to be released and let go. Yeah, and I think to go back to my example of my <laughs> kind of exchange yesterday, my fear, and I can see it now really clearly, the way I intervened because I felt that my child couldn't handle the feelings that were coming up in him at the time. And it was almost like a protective thing. Right. I went in and then obviously undermined my husband somewhat. Um, but I, could, I now know that it was me thinking, oh, he can't handle that. I need to help. And, and actually knowing, of course he can handle it, you know. Children can handle these big emotions because we, we can see the systematic rise and fall and then it's in the ebb afterwards where we can go to him and say, oh, that was a bit intense, you know, and like it, everything's all right then. And I think that while I'm not advocating people allowing children to be in suffering, because obviously we do need to intervene sometimes, that, that sometimes there's a belief that ch children can't handle the natural rise and fall of emotions. But I wonder if that as well, there's, it would have originated from, I, I don't like this, I can't Yeah, I can't handle it for me. I want you to no. be okay, so I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that again is why yeah. this work is so important for working with a client of any kind. But I guess particularly if you're in like coaching, counselling, therapeutic work, because it's, it is, it, it gets the more okayness there is here the more you can sit with whatever the other person's got going on no matter what it is and the knowing of that okayness helps maintain a level of clarity mm. so then yeah like you say that it doesn't mean we never say to somebody that they need some kind of help or that we put an arm around their shoulder or we I mean yeah take them to the doctors and get antidepressants you know it doesn't stop any of that stuff happening but it's the it's kind of coming from the most clear and whole we can be in that moment mm -hmm. rather than from that insecurity here, assuming that there's, there's not okayness over there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's critical though, isn't it? Cause I really couldn't see that for a time that, that I always thought it was, oh, it's their issue and I need to help with their issue, but no, no, no. It's only ever coming from here. No. Yeah. So, no, so yes, simple. Had yeah. that pointed out to me in my coaching yesterday of something apparently going on with my son, and then reflecting it back to me, it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it doesn't make you immune from uh, <laughs> from not making that that error um, constantly. Like, there was that thing over there that's causing my experience. <laughs> It, just, it happens all the time. It's, yeah. it's like we see this stuff. When I first started in this, um, you know, came across this understanding and you kind of have this experience and um, you suddenly think that you're operating in that space 98, 99% of the time. And then over time you realize that, oh, no, I only operate in that space about three or four percent of my life. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, it's such a small um, part of of 
your experience of, of being really kind of being really operating in that in that space of and I'm sure it gets you know it gets more and more and more and you can do state training with your meditation and and you know increase the the amount of times that you stay in this conscious um, state but yeah it's quite small the amount of time you're actually in that conscious state <laughs> that you're not saying oh it's that thing. Yeah, maybe we could never know. Yeah, that's um, fine. That's a good point. Yeah, it's only the identity we that we'd have an opinion on it, and we yeah. no, we can't rely on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any final thoughts then before we come into close? <laughs> Seems like a no. <laughs> maybe it's a no. <laughs> maybe it's a no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully it is relatable because I do find that in my own coaching sessions, I, I am really honest about, oh, yeah, that happened for me this week. And, and I find sometimes that can take any tension out of a conversation of like any expectation of things have to be a certain way, you know, because it means that there's this more relaxed state then if we can be like, yeah, of course that happens over here as well. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully to people listening and watching, uh, they will pick up on that too, you know. Yeah getting more human not less through this yeah yeah and but knowing that you're um infinite as well mm. that, that yeah. you're not just confined to this mm. physical appearance that shows up mm. um that you're infinite possibility and that can be overwhelming i think to think about that because suddenly you think oh you know if i'm infinite then you know, but your actions are limited into what you can do in this moment but you're you have infinite possibility, infinite responsibility, you know, um, but your action is limited. Um, so you're only ever acting from the place you are right now, um, not from where you want to be. It's, mm -hmm. So combining those two things, the humanness of it all and, and the, um, the existential, uh, infinite mm -hmm. nature of yourself, then you know, allows you to have a more richer, fuller life. Mm -hmm. um, than you were having before. Uh, but mm. you know, that means that it's everything, mm -hmm. you know, it's all the emotions, not just one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, cool. nice. That might be a wrap then. Yep, we have no questions. Really? So. Well, thank you so much for everybody who has joined us on the second series. It's been so cool and really brilliant to share this space, a real privilege to be part of this conversation. I can't believe how quickly it's gone, though. Um, we have obviously got the um, Facebook community group, which is a closed setting for what you've been looking for. And it's, I think that's really helpful for people who want to share a little bit more um, in a trusted space. So feel free to join that because that conversation will continue naturally. Um, we are going to take a little bit of a break, but I think there's going to be some chats about uh, hosting a series of webinars potentially, which we have done historically. So please look out for that too. Um, and this episode will go out tomorrow, as usual, on the podcast via all your favourite podcast channels. And you can obviously find us on our social media channels, both collectively and individually. Um, so, yes, thank you so much for your time and for joining us and for all the contribution and engagement along the way. It's been brilliant. Yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah. Yes, we'll see you, you soon. We'll see you soon. Yep. Yeah, we're out. Cool. <laughs>